Well, uh, good evening to folks. Um, it's uh, exciting to be welcomed back, and it's exciting to see uh, the Gyoja and um, uh, sensei that are uh, starting to convene for uh, this year's Gyo session um, and uh, bringing back a lot of gratitude and a lot of um, <laughs> memories and I know a lot of important uh, a lot of important uh, teachings about to happen. Um, for those who don't know me, my name's uh, Reverend Kishin Mendaika. Uh, thank you to Sensei for that introduction as I do live here in St. Paul, Minnesota with my wife and three young children. It's been 11 years now since I first started my training at the New York Betsuin, so I've been lingering from the distance with you all for <laughs> some time now. Um, uh, again, thank, thank you to you all, um, to this community for uh, hosting uh, this important uh, experience for these trainees. Um, it will be life-changing for them, and uh, I hope you feel the deep appreciation that um, everybody that goes through, goes through this process uh, has for uh, the way you welcome folks into uh, your spiritual home like this. Um, I was delighted uh, to have had the chance to speak to um, this Sangha this past spring on a pretty heady topic um, for uh, those uh, who weren't able to join that I think is probably going to be uploaded here on YouTube uh, before too long. Um, when I was asked to return in August, honestly, I was I was a little relieved because I know that the last one was, um, you know, pretty intellectual. Um, my goal in general is, in speaking about Buddha Dharma is to try to make topics from traditional Buddhist teachings and practices accessible to contemporary audiences. Um, the last time what I was focusing on was sort of a, a cryptic part of Mahayana philosophy in the Yogacara mind only school. Um, Tonight, what I want to attempt to do is to connect two aspects of religious practice that some might see as unrelated or even divergent. Um, on the one hand, more and more contemporary Western Buddhists um, are becoming aware of how Buddhist practice can and should contribute to work towards social and environmental harmony. These activities align with interreligious and secular ideas of co-creating a more peaceful world. On the other hand, devotional activities, especially those directed toward ancestors, can easily seem culturally specific, not relevant to modern life. So what I like to do is uh, challenge those assumptions about how traditional Asian practices do and don't relate to our spiritual lives here and now. Um, I didn't create a handout tonight because much of what we'll be discussing are topics that have been covered in different ways by Monshin Sensei and others previously. So my hope is that this presentation will make connections for you between those topics and give you a new or a refreshed context for your own practice. So the thesis I'm working with this evening is that Buddhist prayer and ritual are tools for contending with both individual and collective suffering that exists here and now. Before we get into this exploration, I'm gonna tangent to a point about translation. The Sanskrit word that's normally translated as mindfulness actually has more of a connotation of remembering. One piece of meditation practice is remembering the object of meditation. So we sit and our minds wander and we forget our breath or whatever that object of meditation is. And then we remember, when we return. This is connected to how the Sanskrit idiom of yoga is understood as a yoking of the practitioner's mind, the Buddha's mind. Um, but we're not merely recalling the object, but reattaching the members of a larger body. So the Eightfold Noble Path includes Samyak Smirti, or right mindfulness, or remembering. The Buddha Shakyamuni teaches us that in order to gain awakening, we remember those dharmas, which will contribute to insight and compassion. On the other hand, one of the most harmful acts, according to the Buddha Dharma, is creating splits in community. Our work's not only to eliminate suffering in the world among beings as individuals, but to recollect or remember a global awareness of our interconnectedness. I want to address this evening the importance of including attitudes and practices that bring our ancestors into that work. In particular, I'm going to emphasize how ancestral devotions are a part of our commitment as Buddhists to building harmony between humans and the environment, and how, in an important sense, there's no real distinction to be made between how we treat what we call the natural world and how we treat one another. So let's sink into this exploration. The first thing I wanna do here is give a broader context to ancestral devotion. Folks have maybe heard the term animism before. Uh, simply put, animism is the view that phenomena that our dominant culture see as inanimate, such, such as plants, rocks, natural phenomena like bodies of water and celestial objects, are imbued with life and their own personalities. 
I've included a quote here from an anthropologist who's written on animism and ancestral devotion. He says, animists are people who recognize that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship to others. Animism is lived out in various ways that are all about learning to act respectfully, carefully and constructively towards and among other persons. So I think this quote captures an important piece of the point I'm making this evening, that this very old form of religious expression, many social scientists believe this is the oldest form of religion, relates directly to views on morality. If everything in our environment becomes alive, we're compelled to consider our ethical obligations to these phenomena as sentient beings. This view of a deeply alive world is not only unique to Japanese culture, but the opposite is true. Our divorce from this worldview is highly unusual in human history. So I like to bring pop culture into our conversations and I've got an image here from an animated film released back in 2016 set during Oban. The conception of reality depicted in Kubo and the two strings of an Oban celebration with the real presence of the ancestors and spirits of the so-called natural world be familiar to people from most times and places. Uh, when I was putting this together, my kids saw this picture. They actually thought it was at first that it was from the movie Coco from Pixar based on the Mesoamerican Dia, Dia de los Muertos. Uh, so these beliefs and practices aren't unique to Japan or Buddhism. Instead, our hard distinctions of the living and dead and the natural and human realms are the exception. So I wanna make sure that we're seeing that this notion of ancestors and our connection to place really belong together put a finer point on it, what they share in common is that we're here in this life and in this geographic location because of them. They constitute causes and conditions for our existence in this human body. They've built and sustained this vehicle we travel in to engage in Buddhist practice. So not only do we have a commitment to them as sentient beings, but we have a profound reason to be grateful for them. That our culture doesn't prioritize expressing that gratitude should really give us pause. What is it that we're doing if we aren't regularly in public and private ways acknowledging the reasons for our existence? I'm gonna let that question sit, and I wanna examine it more specifically for us as Buddhists uh, in North America primarily. I know we have folks joining us from uh, different places beyond the cyber datu. Um, first, I wanna talk about Buddhism and modernity. Monshin Sensei has done a very good job of introducing this community to the idea of Buddhist modernism. I'm not going to cover this topic comprehensively, but I want to summarize some important key takeaways for this discussion. By the 19th century, Buddhist cultures in Asia were threatened by colonial incursion from European and American powers. Broadly speaking, the purported values of modernity in the Eurocentric world are rational skepticism and the value of the individual. However, when we look at the historical trends in these societies, what we see enacted is an ethic of human and environmental exploitation and militarism used to maximize the accumulation of wealth and power. These priorities have contorted culture and religion in order to serve their ends. The upshot of that's been an alienation of people from their environments and one another. So let's take, for example, the very notion of the so-called natural world. The treatment of colonized lands as inanimate objects available as sources of wealth extraction give rise to a completely dissociated understanding of our relationship with our environment. This created the milieu in which 19th century American transcendentalists conceived of distinct natural and human domains, one that was pure and inherently good, and the other contaminated and contaminating. Just as these historical trends have influenced our relationship to our physical environment, they've also disrupted how we connect to our social environment. The history of institutionalized racism dates back to 1678 and the creation of legal categories of black and white by the Virginia legislature. This came in response to Bacon's rebellion. This was a 1676 uprising in Virginia that brought European indentured servants and African slaves together in solidarity to resist landowners. The laws were intended to create barriers to future joint action by creating an illusion of difference and hierarchy. Over time, the system of whiteness that emerged obligated people to trade in their sense of humanity, cultural traditions, and sense of collective memory in order to gain the protection created by whiteness. Buddhist modernism seeks proximity to this whiteness by intentionally shedding so-called cultural trappings. This reinforces the dominant culture's pressure to remain alienated from our place and community, both across space and time. A secular mindfulness that does not question our role as consumers and upholders of the status quo 
can't serve as a vehicle of collective liberation. In order to address the karma that creates environmental and social disharmony, we need to have practices, I just say religious practices in particular, that give us an awareness of our place in history. I think that this is a really important way to understand insight into the nature of cause and effect. How does this life in this conventional body fit into the grand scheme of what's happened, what's happening, and the future reality of collective awakening? If we approach a practice of the Buddha Dharma from this perspective, we have to consider how we can allow the tradition to inform how we reconstitute or remember our sense of community and allow the entire world to come up alive around us. Once we allow the world around us to come alive, it's not something that we can just use. And our ancestors are no longer merely genetic platforms from which we exercise our own individual agency. We have a mutual dependence. We rely on the world and our ancestors to thrive and they rely on us. So I don't wanna to spend too much time admiring the problem, so to speak. Uh, I hope that I've covered enough ground at the right levels that I've established one, there's a collective disconnection from family and community histories and from our environment. And two, that these are intentionally created conditions. I think that gaining insight into the causes of this alienation provides a direction to how we move forward. So before I get into the content here in this slide, I wanna emphasize that the goal is to move forward one tempting reaction to an awareness that modern life has separated us from our past is a valorization of the past. This is simply the other extreme, and it can lead to a dangerous obsession with blood and land. What I want to orient us toward is a middle path directed by wisdom and compassion that carries us toward awakening, not darkness. So as I've said, we face a problem of intentional forgetting. And I've asserted that the Buddhist response is remembering. Relating to our ancestors first means getting to know our collective stories. Much of the knowledge we're talking about accruing here is knowledge that would be taken for granted in many traditional societies. But I'd also suggest that using modern forms of scholarship and psychosocial reflection can expand on that knowledge. So what this slide addresses is not only restoring collective memories, but connecting ancestral wisdom with modern wisdom as a seamless whole. And the first step in that is knowing who your family is. Genealogy work is a vital part of being able to appreciate how far back your story goes. Beyond the family tree though, I'd encourage you to start to ask about what, what you know about the times and places in which your family members lived, that social history. One question for folks living in North America whose ancestors came here from other continents is what were the reasons for leaving where they were from? Many of these stories are filled with poverty, violence, despair, terror. It's incredibly common to hear parents and grandparents who hold some of these memories say some version of, it's better that we forget about all that. But this is precisely the remembering that I'm talking about doing in order to awaken from the illusion of separateness. Similarly, by excavating the traditions, having that cultural awareness that have been lost over time through assimilation into this dominant culture, you can discover how your ancestors lived out their awareness of interdependence. For those of us who may be two or three generations removed from that immigrant experience, even if our families have forgotten everything else about the past, we likely still hold on to a small handful of food traditions. What if we scratch the surface on those? Why did our ancestors eat this food? Where did they get it from? Why was this dish worth keeping alive? When was it eaten? What does that tell me about how my ancestors related to the seasons? This is just an example of exploring food ways. You can pull any cultural thread, folk art, music, architecture, and you'll find out more about not only your ancestors, but yourself than you'd imagine. The further we dive into these types of customs, the more we come back to environment, community, gratitude, and survival. Finally, working through an examination of the patterns of disease and dysfunction in our families, especially with that historical and cultural context, gives us an awareness of how suffering manifests in our families. This awareness is critical to breaking out of the shame and isolation that drive a pursuit of individual awakening. We're not simply heroes on our own path to attainment. We're more like holograms. When people look at me, what they're actually seeing is the reflections of the efforts, failures, and breakthroughs of the communities from which I emerge. Our pain and our resilience are our ancestors' pain and our ancestors' resilience. 
I want to be clear that these aren't simply intellectual exercises or curiosities. What's learned in this study, like any realization or growth that happens on the spiritual path, is an embodied experience. If you've ever seen uh, the show Finding Your Roots with Dr. Henry, Henry Louis Gates on PBS or similar programs, you'll see the impact that these types of discoveries can have. Every episode, guests are moved to tears at realizing that their existence has a context. Their stories are part of a much longer process that's been playing out for generations. It's that tangible embodied feeling of belonging to something larger than yourself. That's the gem in this work. That's what empowers us to break down barriers to our collective awakening. The Franciscan priest, Father Richard Rohr, often repeats the refrain that pain that's not transformed is transmitted. This is another way of speaking to how samsara and interdependence relate. Our ancestors contributed to the reality in which we live, the reality of our bodies, our families, and our society. Again, our pain is their pain. Our resilience is their resilience. When William Faulkner writes that the past isn't dead, it's not even the past, he's touching on this non-duality of past, present, and of course, future. The future is the open-ended possibility of how our ancestors' pain and our pain might be transformed or transmitted. So as Tendai Buddhists, we bring together study and practice. That's the path that I'm encouraging this evening. I've covered the type of study that builds a useful view to bring to ancestral devotion, but what are the practices? As I cover these practices, I'm also invoking the paradox of afterlife beliefs in Japanese Buddhism. On one level, ancestors are thought of as residing in the hungry ghost realm. Now, this might not necessarily be the case for all ancestors, but even among family members for whom all the appropriate funeral and memorial rituals were conducted to provide them passage to a wholesome destination, it can still sometimes stretch the imagination to conceive of some people as becoming awakened beings. The Oban celebration is an offering of sustenance to the hungry ghosts, the ancestors who dwell among us trying to fulfill the craving that plagues them for the entirety of their existence in that realm. We make offerings of both food and prayer in the hopes that the merit we generate will lift them out of this painful realm. At the same time, ancestors are also held as kami or spirits. This view dates back to pre-Buddhist Japan and is woven into Buddhist practices there. In this sense, family members are active agents in our present lives, supporting us to influence events, encouraging us to thrive, and protecting us from harm. By creating spaces for them, both in our homes and at, al at altars and in cemeteries, and speaking with them through regular prayer, we acknowledge their real presence among us. This status as kami also connects our ancestors to the realm of the spirits that inhabit the environment in the forms of animals, plants, rivers, lakes, mountains, and other natural phenomena. They comprise a community of the phenomenal world in which we live. Finally, the ancestors exist in a transcendent state beyond the samsaric realm. Understandings of the funeral traditions vary across schools of Buddhism, but in Tendai, the funeral enacts the awakening of the deceased. The priest conducts the funeral and performs the rituals leading to the individual's realization of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. In this way, they're known from then on as a Buddha. From a conventional Western perspective, this diversity of views seems sort of dizzying. As you've heard from others in the past, though, this is a fairly comfortable construct in Japan. It recognizes people need different approaches for different experiences in life, skillful means. And when it comes to family and to the death of family, I think it's safe to say that things can get complicated. If we think of a loved one we lost, we may need to understand them as having moved beyond the pain of this world. We might at other times need to feel their close presence like we did in their previous life. And we might also continue to relate to them through their unresolved struggles, see them as still tortured by the same pain of that previous life. As I mentioned before, their pain is our pain. Their resilience is our resilience. By remembering them to our sense of community, we can recall the string of causality that created the struggles we're faced with today. By knowing how they tried to keep their communities of people and the environment together and why those bonds were shattered, we can be a part of their aspiration to transform the pain that exists in our bodies, in our families, and in our society. By making our ancestors real, these devotional practices create community of energy and accountability, just like the Sangha that you all have built. 
So going back to the foundational Buddhist scriptures, the Buddha Shakyamuni is recorded as teaching about the incredible fortune of a human rebirth. It's in this body that we're most capable of receiving and putting into practice the Buddha Dharma. It's our ancestors who are most directly responsible for creating this opportunity. At the same time, we know that our ancestors transmitted the pain of their previous lives. We feel that pain today, collectively, as the systems of exploitation, destruction, and alienation that plague our society. So as I come to a close here, I wanna in particular call in uh, my peers who have benefited from white advantages in your life as I have. We too often mistake the work for being aware of how others suffer and how our ancestors may have participated in that. So I'm saying, let's flip that script. Let's explore through our religious practice, how our ancestors may have cut the ties with their past in order to escape suffering, not knowing that they were merely transmitting their pain. By allowing our religious beliefs and practices to help us understand our lives in that context, we can participate in actions towards environmental and social harmony as insiders instead of outsiders. That allows us to move beyond white fragility and guilt and towards skillful action. So tonight, I wanna to encourage everyone to consider how your commitment to acts of mercy and the promotion of harmony in society and our environment affect the liberation of all beings, including those who preceded us. Their liberation is our liberation. Through our devotions, we come to experience them ourselves, all sentient beings, as the noble ones needed to transform the world. So appreciate your time, um, invite any questions and um, offer for Sensei if you have any observations or questions. I, I think you did a great job. I agree with everything that you happen to say. <laughs> Thank you for saying it. And I think you did, a, um, I have nothing more to add. You, you, you basically encapsulated what I would have presented, um, but you did it in a very, a very skillful way. Thank you. What questions does everyone have? We're gonna, we're gonna uh, stop the recording.